Welcome back, church. Last week, we began talking about 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and really we were discussing it under the guise of accountability and sanctification, the importance of sanctification, and the importance of battling sin, the importance of the gospel testimony of the local church. Uh, so we're going to kind of pick up with that theme and really look more generally uh, this evening. Paul argues from the specific to the general, and so that's kind of the task we're taking with this chunk of Scripture as well. But let's go ahead and read through it. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of the kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife. And you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Do you know that do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world, or the greedy, or swindlers, or idolaters, since then you would have to go out of the world. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality, or greed, or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. So really we're talking about the importance of accountability within the local fellowship. And this should be led by and carried out by obviously the elders within that church. Now, we've been talking about, again, these themes. So, last week we talked about our call to sanctification and what that means to be set apart from sin to God, to continue to battle sin, and we need God's help in that because we are imperfect people. We looked at their behavior and their immorality and their arrogance and possibly their distorting of Christian liberty, falsely believing that sin wasn't really a big deal anymore because Christ died to cover sin, so who cares? I can just keep living in sin, and it doesn't really matter. Well, that's to miss the entire point of Christian liberty and to really not care about our testimony and the glory of God. So we looked at the Westminster Confession, chapter 20 there, that pointed out that Christian liberty is to be delivered out of the hands of our enemies so that we might serve the Lord without fear and holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our lives. We compared humanistic Christianity with God-centered Christianity and really challenged ourselves with where are we on that spectrum? Are we truly seeking to live for the glory of God or are we still tempted to kind of twist Christianity into a man-centered, man-serving thing? So what should they have done? They should have confronted it. They should have removed the offender. They should have made it clear that he was not uh, a, a part of the local assembly. Why? Because the Lord disciplines those whom he loves and because it's for his good. Verse 5 says that his spirit might be saved. Discipline does not treat the offender unfairly, but is to his benefit. It also speaks to the purity of the church. Uh, and it also is because God holds the church accountable for what it tolerates. So now let's look at some general principles. So what do we learn? Look at verse 10. Paul makes it clear that he's not talking about all the immorality of the world, or the greedy or swindlers or whatever of the world. See, so principle number one is that we do not shun non-believers. We do not 
hold those who have never confessed Christ accountable as if they had. Paul says, I'm not talking about, he says in verse 9, don't associate with them. And then in verse 10, he says, I'm not talking about the ones who are of this world or the greedy or swindlers or idolaters. He says, since then you'd have to leave the world. He says, I'm talking to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother. That's the key. If we're claiming Christ, if we're claiming to be Christian, that must mean something. And it means that we've given our lives to God. It means that we understand that the only way we're right with the Holy God is because of the sacrifice of Christ on our behalf. We, we understand those things and we must live those things. But our strategy should not be one of avoidance. If we're going to think about what it means to not shun non-believers, right? You can't leave the world. Paul says, I'm not talking about the sexually immoral of the world or the greedy of the world, whatever. So what does that mean? It means that we can't avoid it. We shouldn't try to leave or escape the world. John 17, verse 18, Jesus says, I've sent them into the world. Acts 1, verse 8, we're called to be witnesses to the ends of the earth, to the remotest part of the earth. Philippians 2.15, we're to be children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. So we can't just build our monastery and hold ourselves off from the world and avoid people because we're to be a light in the darkness. We're to be uh, speaking the gospel to those people. So we can't avoid it. We shouldn't avoid it. And now we're tempted to, especially in times like this. We also shouldn't accept it. We cannot conform to the world. And I think that's what they were doing in Corinth, except they seem to have kind of run way beyond uh, the uh, uh, immorality of even the Corinthian world. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We think differently than the world thinks. Our priorities are different than the world's priorities. So we cannot accept and conform to the world. I also think that not shunning non-believers means that we can't be uh, condescending to the world. I think too often there's this kind of Christian condescension that is ugly. It does not make God look great. <laughs> it does not make people want to hear the gospel. We, sh we shouldn't beat people with the Bible. We shouldn't twist the Bible to just pursue our own or to promote our own political agenda. We shouldn't fault the world for not holding to a standard it is yet to accept. We speak the gospel. We serve each other. We love each other. We love God. We love others. We love our enemies. Sacrificially. See, too often we judge non-believers. We criticize them. We point out all of their sins. We point out how their lives are so horrible, and how they're horrible people, before we share the gospel with them. Or even set a foundation of biblical authority. And then we wonder why our churches aren't more full. Or why it's so difficult to get people to listen to an honest and open presentation of the gospel and the grace of God. Our strategy should be that of Paul's in 1 Corinthians 2.2 2, that we talked about a couple weeks ago that when he wrote, For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We should share the gospel. So tired of seeing Christians beat unbelievers with the Bible, with the law, before they even share the gospel with them. So principle number one, we should not shun non-believers. Principle number two, we have to hold each other accountable. We need to hold each other accountable. Accountability should mean something within, within uh, the congregation of people who are claiming to believe and want to live up to and follow Scripture. First of all, let's talk about what this does not mean. What does holding each other accountable not mean? First of all, it's not a call to point out the minors, right? This isn't a call. It doesn't give people the right to kind of 
poke and prod and pry into people's individual, like the depths of their life and soul, and to try to point out every thing, every little thing they're, that they're doing. This does not mean being unnecessarily critical. Being unnecessarily critical only hinders our ability to minister to people when they need us later. And I think that's why it is so important for Christians to be very intentional about what hills we're willing to die on. Too many times we pick the wrong battles and then later when we do have gospel opportunities to minister to people, they don't want to have anything to do with us and they certainly don't want to hear from us because we chose the wrong battle and we're screaming about something silly earlier. And even if we won that argument, they're not going to want to hear from us later. How, how we do that absolutely impacts our ability to truly minister. So we need to intentionally think about the times we want to be involved with each other and help each other. What this does mean, this means that holding each other accountable, biblical accountability, means that if someone's life is characterized by a pattern of egregious sin, it must be dealt with biblically. If someone's life is characterized by open, unrepentant, egregious sin, then someone should love them enough to confront them, to deal with it biblically. The sins that are listed here in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 are in the substantive case, which means that it's not just a one-time event. These are things that are kind of occurring, continuing in that person's life. That's what we're talking about here. Biblical accountability must be done with the proper attitude. Verse 2 in 1 Corinthians 5, Ought you not rather to mourn over their sin? He says, why are you arrogant? Why are you accepting it? Shouldn't you mourn over this? Right? A, 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 a rightly done biblical right, correction or case of biblical discipline is going to be something that's weighty and heavy and sorrowful and taken seriously. There's no gloating in it. There's no room for pride in any of that. Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Brethren, if a man is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, so spiritual maturity, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens. And thus fulfill the law of Christ. We have in those couple of verses a beautiful attitude of, of biblical confrontation with humility and meekness and understanding that we're not better than anybody else. That we could be tempted to, to fall into this sin ourselves. And, and as it's confronted, seeking to restore, we're bearing each other's burdens. We're not preaching from on high and throwing the Bible in somebody's direction. We're walking with them through this. It should be done in the proper manner. Matthew chapter 18. This should be done as privately as possible. You go to him yourself, and if he refuses to listen to you, you take another one or two other mature spiritual brothers. And if he refuses to listen to them, only then do you call them to public Repentance, repentance, and that's the purpose. The purpose of Brit is to bring the person to repentance, to restored fellowship, and that's the goal. The goal is always repentance and restoration. The goal, the goal is always reformative, not punitive. And they're always allowed back in if repentant. See Luke chapter seventeen, verse four. So as we think about this chapter, as we think about these difficult things. Here's the point, I think. I think. I think we need to be intentional to take the gospel, not the law, to the world. We need to build each other up, even when it means tough decisions, even when it means hard and awkward conversations. We think about the biblical names of the church. The church is called the body of Christ, the temple of the Holy Spirit, the heavenly Jerusalem, the pillar and bulwark of truth. 
the household of God and the bride of Christ. How we live matters. How we live individually reflects upon God and is a testimony to what we believe about God. How we live individually and what we tolerate individually and especially within the congregation is what an unbelieving culture sees about our local fellowship. So that I pray that we would grow in our understanding of the high calling that God has given the church. I pray that we would take it seriously, not for us, not so that people would think that we are so good or righteous or holy, but for the honor and the glory of God and as a testimony that will make the church and the grace of God and the name of God and the biblical God attractive, that people would have hearts that would hear that we would be able to live in such a way that they would give weight to our testimony, that, that it would be clear that we don't think we're better than anybody else. We just know that we're sinners who have found the Savior. And we constantly need to repent and to continue to turn and continue to be sanctified for the glory of God. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for your love for us. We're thankful for our calling in Christ. We're thankful for salvation. We're thankful for sanctification, that Salvation is just the beginning, that we can continue to live a life for your glory. When we fall, may we be quick to repent. May we be encouraged by those who uh, seek to disciple us and mentor us in the faith. May we be glad when a uh, brother or sister and somebody who truly loves us seeks to offer words of correction. May we take that as an understanding that uh, our life matters that our testimony matters. Father, I pray that you would help us to guard the testimony of our local assembly. I pray that you would help us to live in such a way that you are shown as glorious and gracious and good as we know you are. Continue to sanctify us. Continue to grant us faith and favor. Continue to help us to live faithfully for you with every day that you give us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.